the second announcement is that I have posted uh, the midterm solutions on times. So you can check because I received a lot of queries that you wanted to check your results. So that's why I posted the solutions on times. Um, so I will share my screen for you because I wanted to show you that the way that I have marked your questions, your, uh, sorry, midterm, how is the way that I have marked? I have used the Excel sheet and then I have used the formula because uh, for some questions you were required to answer one, for some of the other questions you were required to answer two or three. So that's why I calculated a formula in Excel to capture um, all your answers, whether it is A, B, or everything. So I just share my screen very quickly with you because I received a lot of queries. So that's why I wanted all of you to see that some of you may be, um, you were suspicious that you, whether I've captured your answers correctly or not. So that's why I'm sharing my screen to see. These are your answers. So you can see that, for example, this is question one. And this is, for example, answer that you have given, okay? For this person, for example, the answer is, um, this person has given the answer A. And then the next person, for example, you can see, you see that once I click here, your answer is appearing here. So the answer, this person has given B and C. The next person, for example, we try this, this person has given A, B, and C. And the answer, for example, for question one, for this question has been only A. So that's why you can see that the person, like this person who has given A and B, A is correct, but since B is not correct, so that's why the final answer is zero. So the final mark is zero. So the same goes with other question. For example, let's say that this person, this person has given B and C. So the part A, which is correct, he gets zero, then the other one also automatically, because this is wrong, is zero, and then the final is zero. So you can see that I've created, for all of this cell, you can see that I have put the formula here again. I have put the formula, and this is the final answer. So if you want to see for all questions, I have did the same. So I have put, this is the, for example, next question, this is the answer, this part is correct, but since the last part is not correct, so the final mark on the second question is zero. So the same I have done for all of you. I shared this to make sure to assure you that you see I have used the formula so all um, are correct. And again, just to show you that, to make, to assure you that uh, what is your answers and whether you have answered correctly or not. So I post the solutions on times. So if you want to see your answers and you don't have your answers, then yes, you may contact me. I make a consultation for, with you and then I show you that what is your answers. For example, the way that I can show you, I don't know any of you, you want to see your answers. For example, I click on here and then I show you that for each question, how many marks you have gained. So this is about um, the meta. Then, um, Yesterday, one of your friends contacted me for the assignment, recording the assignment, and then she raised a very good question. Then um, after her question, I wanted to post one announcement on times for you. But before I post the announcement, I explained for you. Last night I went, after I had uh, the consultation with her, so I went out and to buy something from the pharmacy after very long. Um, then I recorded a video once I was out. So I recorded a very quick video. I will post it on times later. Now it is in my Telegram. From the Telegram, I have to post on YouTube to copy the link for you there. Um, what was um, her query? Her query was about the assignment. The topic of the assignment is about technology, environment, and economic growth. And we have asked you to discuss about the positive or negative aspect of it. So the point that you have to remember is that we are talking about three factors. We are talking about technology, environment, and then economic growth. So if any of these factors is left out, so it means that you are not in a right track because we want all these three factors together. 
if you read the part of the article that I have pasted for you, the article is specifically is mentioning that we are talking about the effect of the technology on the economic growth and, uh, sorry, a technology on the environment and then the effect of environment on the economic growth. If I want to talk more academically, so we are talking about one relationship between the technology and economic growth, but we have a mediator in between and the environment is the mediator, mediation or mediating this relationship. So this mediator might have the negative impact, impact or positive impact. That's up to you. That's how you can support, you can find support from the literature and you can support your arguments. But what is important is that you have to make sure that you have to talk about three kinds of relationships, not only one. You should not talk only about the relationship between technology and economic growth. So that's why the role of the environment should be taken care. If you want to twist this relationship with any other way, that's up to you. I leave it to you. For example, maybe you want to try from environment and say the effect of environment on the technology and the technology and the economic growth. I leave it to you. But what is important is that all the three factors, the relationship between them and how they are one by one they are impacting each other until the impact is reaches the economic growth, that should be considered in your right. Um, so that was about your assignment. And if you don't have any other question, I can continue with our topic. So any question? Okay. Yeah, Ethan, you want to say something? No, no, miss. I wanted to ask, I wanted to mention your name, say Ethan, normally you have questions. Are you sure you don't have any questions? Okay. Uh, so let's continue with the first question. Tutorial four, right? Boy, let me share my screen. Okay, so tutorial four, as you remember, the topic of our uh, the topic of our fourth topic was about uncertainty, and somehow it's about consumer behavior. Um, in the during the lecture class, uh, we discuss about the risk, how to quantify the risk and then how to bring the concept of um, risk and return. And then gradually we are moving um, to explain you that the real life scenarios, sometimes they cannot be accommodated into all theory. So gradually we are moving to the part uh, to say that human behavior is much more complex to be embedded inside any theory. And whatever the theories are trying to explain our behavior, but still we are human. We might able to react or to behave in a way that the theories are not able to explain about it. And specifically um, in economic terms, because the theories are very rigid. Um, and then once the human is becoming into that theories, so that conflict or that contracts will be more highlighted. So in this way, just do remember that. So let's read the first question. Um, one more thing that I have to highlight is that the reason that you see that I do the tutorial question myself and I don't leave it to you because I consider that the session is more, most, more like the lectorial. So that's why I have a lot of things that I'm teaching you here. It's not just the recap of our previous lecture. So some points are very new for you. So that's why you just consider that it's a lectorial class. I'm lecturing you with using some examples. So now here I read the first question for you and then gradually you can feel what I explained just now. You can feel that the reaction of the consumer. So that's why you are talking about the uncertainty and consumer behavior. So it means that consumer decision gradually are appearing into these theories. So the, the question is saying that this, okay, is any better? Okay, the question is saying that there has, there has just been a big snowstorm 
you and so you stop at the hardware store to buy a snow shower. You had expected to pay to pay twenty dollars for the shower, the price that the store normally charges. So it means that the store the shower price normally is twenty dollars. However, you find that the store has suddenly raised the price to forty dollars. Although you would expect a, a price increase because of the storm, so it means that the expected price increase because we know that the demand is increasing, right? So you feel that the doubling of the price is unfair and, and that the store is trying to take advantage of you. Out of, out of spite, you do not buy the shower. So now I'm asking you to link this example to the fairness concept. So do you feel consumer reaction here? So if you want to talk about the pure economic and economic theory, so it's very simple. It is law of demand, and then it is the external factor, which is, for example, the snow that is affecting uh, the demand. And so since it is affecting the demand, demand is increasing, so we expect a higher um, rate, higher price. Till here is economic theory. What is coming in the picture some, suddenly as a consumer behavior is here, is that you feel that doubling of the price is unfair. Then here you are showing yourself, you are showing this consumer behavior. And normally we react. If we feel that something is not fair, definitely we react about it. So how is our reaction? The our reaction actually is the way that we demand that product. So that's why our reaction is affecting the demand. Okay, so now, are you able to tell me that how our reaction is affecting the demand? The answer for this question is available in one of the sets of the slide that is available in your times. So a slide number 25, sorry, 35 and 36 are about the behavioral economics. Behavioral economics is exactly the concept that just now I explained for you, that some of our behavior is in a way that we cannot explain it via the classical theories. Theory of consumer demand is not able to explain some of these reactions. So we have, we have provided you some examples here. And as you can see, the, per, the first example is the example that I have put in the tutorial question. So this is the first example. We have many of other, other these kind of examples. So you can study this. However, the answer for the first example is available here. Now I want to show you that how our behavior is actually changing the demand curve. Normally, what do we expect about the demand curve? We expect that demand curve is one a straight line. So in this scenario, you can see that the demand curve here is V1. And the price, we say that the normal price that we expected is this 20. So that's why you can see this $20 here. You can see the demand curve. And let's say that the quantity that we, uh, the quantity demanded is, for example, Q1. We don't care how much is it. We just care about the price. Then suddenly, due to the situation, for example, a snowstorm, then the demand curve is shifting to right. Okay, so the demand curve is shifting right. Let's say that previously the price has been twenty. If the price is remaining the same, the amount that we're gonna demand is gonna be Q2. But we know that the price might slightly increase because the demand has shifted, okay? So let's say that the price until 25, we expected because it, let's say that you have, the, you have the supply curve, let's say that if, for example, a supply curve here, so in initially the price has been 20, now after that, for example, let's say that the supply curve is here, so that's why you expect that the price is 25. And then, yeah, it is fair, it is acceptable. But once you notice that the price is not 25 and the price is 40. So what is your reaction? Your reaction is very simple, that you don't buy, right? So it means that a lot of people, simply because they feel that it is unfair 
and um, the seller is taking advantage of them because the seller knows that they are in dire need. So that's why the people, they um, refuse to buy. So once they refuse to buy, what does it mean? This refusal to buy, what does it mean? It means that there will be a change in the demand curve. Till here, till the point of 25, so we have our normal demand is here. But after this point, suddenly you know that the demand curve, the demand suddenly for this product will decrease, sudden decrease. So how do you show the sudden decrease in demand? It means that the, the slope of the demand function has to change. Why the slope? Because if you remember, the concept of elasticity is related to the slope. You remember this elasticity, right? So now here, is the curve more elastic or less elastic? Of course, it is very elastic now. If you want to show an elastic function, so how the shape of the function is that? What is the slope of the elastic function? If I ask you that, what is the relationship between slope and elasticity? What do you say? What is the relationship between a slope and elasticity? If you want to show that one function is very elastic, what does elastic mean? It means that with one unit increase in price, you substantially decrease your demand. That is the meaning of elastic demand curve. So once more I repeat, elastic demand curve means, maybe I can add here, that elastic demand curve means that with one, unit increase in price, the decrease in Q will be substantial. Okay, so that is the meaning of elastic, elastic curve. So now what is the relationship between elasticity and slope. So if you want to show that one curve is very elastic, how do you show it? You show it through the change of the slope, right? So what is the, how the, is how the change in the slope is showing it? So do we expect that the slope is higher or the slope is less? Of course, the slope is less. Because why you just assume that you want to show one unit of increasing price, let's say from here to here, and you want to show the substantial decrease. So that's why if, for example, the price is increasing one unit, you can see that the change in Q, the change in this line is much, much more than the change in one unit here. So that's why you want to show the relationship between elasticity and, in, and a slope. It means that the more elastic function has less slope. So now from this point onward, from the point 25 onward, that you feel that it's unfair to you, you, substantial, you substantially react. Your reaction means that the slope of the curve will suddenly change here onward. And then you can see that the slope here is suddenly less than the normal slope. This curve is called a kinked curve. I'm sure that you're familiar with kinked, kinked, I'm sure that you're familiar. In your macro, I'm expecting that. Kinked demand curve. So what does kinked demand curve mean? Means that it is broken. Means that the slope from one side to another side has changed. So what has caused this change? Consumer reaction. And that's why this is the topic about the consumer behavior or behavioral economics. 
So we are using the same theories, but we are adjusting the theories that necessarily the slope of the demand function does not go all the way the same. The slope of the demand is not remaining the same. The slope of the demand curve with our reaction is changing and the demand curve is not a straight line anymore. It is a kinked demand curve. So that was the answer for question one. Any questions so far? No question? No, miss. Thank you. So we continue to the second question. Let's read the second question first. And then on the second question, since we have discussed this week in the class, I expect a bit of help from you. It is saying that a city is considering how much to spend to hire people to monitor its parking meters. The following information is available to the city manager. Uh, my friends, these kind of questions are very common questions once you join the industry. That, for example, they want to adjust a new policy, they want to do something new, and they want you to measure that, for example, between different options, which one is the best option. No? What is the question? The question is that they want to know that how many of these monitor meters they need because they want to control the parking situation in the city. So that's why they need to know that how much they have to uh, invest. So the first is saying that now here these four bullet points are given the information, they are given information to you. First is saying that hiring each meter monitor costs 10,000 per year. So this is the cost. Then it's saying that with one monitoring person hired, the probability of the driver getting a ticket each time uh, that he or she parks illegally is equal to okay, 0 0.25. So it means that if I want to summarize, so on a piece of paper, you can summarize it for yourself. I'm summarizing for myself as well. So I'm saying that it is first, I'm writing that it is question two. And then I'm saying that the probability is we have one, meter monitor, the probability is equal to 0 0.25. They're saying that if we have two monitors, the probability of the getting ticket, of course, we expect that it is higher, right? Once you have two monitor, of course, the probability of cutting the people is more. And then uh, with three monitors, if you have three monitors, the probability is 0 0.75 and then if we get four, definitely whoever is parking illegally, they will be caught because the probability is one. So now it is saying that, okay, these are the information on the probability. This is the information of the cost. The last one is saying that with two monitors higher, the current fine for the overtime parking is 20. So this is talking about the current situation, right? So it is saying that the current situation, what is the current situation? That with two monitors, so first of all, we know that we have two monitors and we know that the fine here is equal to 20. So since the fine is 20 and two monitors higher, so this is the current situation. Now definitely we know that the question is asking us that whether they have to remain with these two or they have to decrease the monitors to one or they have to increase it to four. So definitely that's the question because it, it wants to compare it with the current situation. Now let's read the question, it's asking the same thing. That assume first that all drivers are risk neutral, okay? What parking fine would you levy and how many meters monitor would you hire? So first of all, you can see that it is comparison with this question. This is our current scenario. So the Question is asking to compare with this. What to compare first of all, what parking fine? No, it is 20. It's saying that you calculate that this 20 is fine or it should be higher or it should be less. And how many meter monitor? Now, if they have two monitors, now it wants to compare that whether we need more than this or less than this. To achieve, to achieve what? This is important. Current, current level of deterrence against illegal parking at minimum cost. So do remember that this is the important part that first of all, we want the current level of deterrence. So it means that whatever is this situation, we want to keep the current level of deterrence. And at the same time, we want to minimize the cost. 
So two things is given to us that keeping the deterrence at the same level, minimizing the cost, okay? So now, how to make sure that we want to keep the same level of deterrence? What do we have? We have the monitors two and $20. So what we can con calculate? Expected, expected fine, right? So we know that we have two monitors and the probability of these two monitors to catch the illegal parking, the illegal people is 0 0.5. And the amount of the fine is 20, but is it certain or is it not certain, this 20? Definitely it's not certain because these two monitors are not catching everybody. They are catching only 50% of the people. So that's why we have to make sure that first we calculate our expected fine and then we have to make sure that the expected fine over the other situation to have one, two, three, four. Over all situation is the same. Then we have to calculate that which one is giving us the minimum cost. Let me share this. Okay, once I was explaining for you, I was writing down the question. Yeah, that this is question two, tutorial, topic four. Yeah. So, what we have to calculate first, as I explained just now, that this fine is 20, but we know that this fine is not confirmed. Why it is not confirmed? because we have two monitors and we know that the probability is 0 0.5, right? So now this week lecture, how much is the expected fine? Expected fine is the probability of one situation multiplied by the value of that situation plus probability of the second situation multiplied by the value of the second situation. So probability of being caught is 0 0.5. Multiply by the value of being caught, it is $20. Plus probability of not being fined, again it is 0 0.5. And how much is the value if we don't get fined? Of course it's zero. So how much is the expected fine? Expected fine is 10. So that is the expected fine. Now what is this giving to us? This is telling us that if we want to keep the same level of deterrence for other scenarios, we have to make sure that the expected fine is 10, 10 units. So now it means that for all of these scenarios for here, we want to make sure that expected fine is 10. The same is here, expected fine is 10. The same is here, expected fine is 10. So for all of them, the expected fine has to remain the same. Are you able to calculate the amount of the fine for each of these scenarios if we want to have the expected fine equal to 10? So it seems very easy, right? So how to calculate the fine? Expected fine, for example, here is 10. How to calculate that? How much should be the fine? I'm waiting. This one, this part, I need your help. Please help. What should I run? How much? 2.5. 2.5 is the probability, right? The probability of being fine. So we have to, we know that the expected fine is 10. So that's why I have to write, okay, let me write it here that for example, situation one is having one monitor. Okay, so one monitor. The expected fine, I know that it is 10. But what is the formula of expected fine? 
probability of being fine, it is 25%. Multiply by the value of the fine, which I don't know how much is this. I want to calculate this. I want to know that how much is the value of fine if I want the expected fine to be 10. So plus the probability of not being fine, which is 75. And then of course the value of not being fine is zero. So how much is the fine if we have one monitor to make sure that the expected fine is 10, which is equal to our current situation. So how much is X? 40. Exactly, so X is 40. So this is the amount of the fine with having one monitor. One monitor. Okay, how much is the cost? We want to make sure that we have the same amount of the cost. Uh, sorry, we want to minimize the cost. Okay, thank you that you are answering in the chat box for, with me that at least I can assure that you are following me. So the next, first, uh, okay, let's finish this, that the fine is 40 and how much is the cost? The cost, the question has given you the cost. The cost for each monitor is 10,000. So here we have one monitor, so that's why the cost is 10,000. So this is our answer, that here, we have to make the fine for $40 and the cost is $10. So what was the current situation? The current situation was here, right? So let's write the benchmark. The benchmark means the current situation. Then we want to compare all the situation with the benchmark. So this is our benchmark. Okay, so what was the benchmark? That fine is 20 and the cost is 20,000 because we are using two monitors. Then we go for the next situation. The next situation is three, right? Having three monitors. So having three monitors, again, we know that the expected fine is supposed to be 10. The probability of getting fine if we have three is 75%. I don't know how much is the fine. And then the probability of not being fine is 25. And then of course zero is the fine. So how much is X? 13.33. Exactly, 13.33. So this is the second, the fine for the second scenario. So that's why again I write that the fine in this scenario is 30.33. And how much is the cost? So, and then we move to the last option. The last option is where that we have four monitors. Four monitors, the expected return is 10, and then the probability is one. How much is the X? X is supposed to be 10, the fine. So it means that the situation, the last situation, fine is 10, and the cost is Okay, now which easiest question ever? Which one should you go for? You want to minimize the cost. You want to have the same deterrence. Same deterrence is, it means that this condition, this condition that you assume that the expected fine for all of them is the same. So that's why once you put the expected fine equal to 10 for all of them. So it means that you are taking care of the first condition in the question. So that's why the first condition is tick. So what is the second condition to minimize the cost? Of course, the cost here is minimized, right? 10,000 compared to 20,000 compared to 30,000 and 40,000. So that's why the answer for this question is that you suggest the manager of the city to go for this option. Minimize the cost and of course increase the fine. So the fine now is 20, is less. That's why we have to increase the fine to 40 and then instead we can hire only one monitor. So that is the second question. Then what is the next question? What, okay. 
for the next question before i continue with the next question i will play the videos that we didn't get time to play during the lecture so i play two videos for you they are not very long videos very short but please pay attention the formula that i'm describing in the question in the video i need to use for this question so the question what is the question and what is the video is about the relationship between the risk and return from the macro aspect, we know that the risk and return, they have positive relationship because if you expect to get the higher return, you have to bear more risk. So that's why both, they are moving in the same direction. But from the micro aspect, we want to show that what is if we want to draw the line for the risk and return, how is the line? So that's why um, if you remember previously, we discussed about some part of the topic that we discussed about the situation that the investor wants to make a portfolio. That portfolio consists of two kinds of assets. One is the risk-free asset, and the other one is the risky asset. So that's why we want to make sure that for, um, due, um, with that current, with that situation, and with the amount of the amount of the investment that the investor is dedicating to the risk-free and risky asset, so how much how to calculate the return on the portfolio and how to calculate the risk. So now I will play, but I'm not sure that we will be able to hear the audio or not. So just let me know. Okay, let me share my screen again. Now that we calculated this part, I want to open up this. So let's see that. RM, I'm just opening this part. Minus RM, and then RM is equal to, I keep RF here. So it's the same thing. It's exactly like here, just I have open up. Then instead of B here, I can calculate B from this formula. B is equal to this. So and then I replace it here. So it means that RP is equal to RF plus sigma P over sigma M RF minus RF. Right. Gradually something is appearing. If I want to discuss about the trade off between risk and return, so it means that I want to keep return on this side and I want to keep the risk on the other side. So that's why I can just rewrite this in this way. That RV is equal to RF plus RF minus RF divided by RM and this whole thing multiplied by sigma P. So a very nice formula is appearing here. This is a R nice formula. So what is it just saying if I want to draw it? Yeah, I want to draw the risk and the return portfolio. So this is the intercept. This is the slope. So it means that I'm talking about a function. The function return on the portfolio is my y-axis. Risk of the portfolio is my x-axis. This part, which is the return on risk-free asset, is my intercept. So it means that intercept is here. Do I have any risk here? Of course not. You can see this on the y-axis. In the y-axis, the amount of the risk is zero. And then here is the risk of the portfolio. Sorry, is the slope of the portfolio. The slope of the portfolio that I can draw it like this is called price of the risk. 
So the slope of the portfolio is Rm minus Rm divided by Rm. So this is called price of risk. I have shown you the trade-off between risk and return. So this line is exactly equal to a budget line. So it is showing a relationship or limitation between risk and return, like our relation or limitation between Y and X. So if I draw the utility curve, so it means that I'm done. I reach to my optimum point. So now I want to draw a utility curve. Utility curve between the risk and the return on the portfolio. So the only thing is that whether the utility curve has to have the positive or slope or the negative slope. Can you think about it a few minutes? Okay, let's go to our next video. Correct. The utility curve in the, in the context of risk and return cannot be negative slope anymore. And it is positive slope. Why it is positive slope? So it means that it's like this. Why it is positive slope? Because for the utility curve, each of this utility curve, they have a certain amount of the utility. And along each utility curve, the utility doesn't change. In the context of consumer and X and Y product, since the consumption and X and Y is giving us satisfaction and higher utility, and we want to maintain the same amount of the utility, so that's why once the consumption of one is increasing, the consumption on the other one has to decrease because we want to maintain the same amount of the utility. So now the same is here. Once we are moving along the utility care, we want to make sure that we are having the same amount of the utility. Since risk is undesirable, once we are moving towards having more risk, so to keep the utility at the same level, we have to increase the amount of the return. And that's why with the increase in risk, the, utility, the return has to increase as well. And that shows a positive relationship. So that's why the utility curve in this context is always a positive slope. Hope you have learned it well. Okay. Okay, so it was a kind of recall for the formula that we want to use in our next question. So let's go back to the next question. For the next question, I want to give you a few minutes. I want you to read the question. We will read the question together, but I want you to read the question very carefully and you try to answer the question. So is my screen shared? Please no. So this is the question. So I explain the question for you and then you have to try to do at least the first part is easy. We say now the moderator risk averse investor has 50% of her, her portfolio invested in a stock. Do you, that, do you know that what is this 50% is 50%? Which component is that? Do you remember that? So this 50% it was RB, right? You remember B was the amount that the person is investing in the stock market and then remaining the person will invest in risk free. So that's why B is 50% and of course one minus B is another 50%. So then say that show how each of the following events will affect the investor budget line and the portion of the stock in her portfolio. So it is very important that you have to be very careful that what question is asking you. Okay, so now what is the question asking you first? It is asking you that with this change that it explained later it will explain later so this change how it will affect the investor budget line and how it will affect the poor proportion of the stock in the portfolio what does it mean it means that with this change this investor prefers to have more stock which are the risky asset 
or the person prefer to have less stock. So now the first scenario. The first scenario is that expected return on the spot market increases, but the standard deviation of the spot market remains the same. So if we want to refer to our slides, it means that, um, my friends, I explained to you that we have two sets of slides in this topic, and the reason is that I couldn't find a book that covers all the aspects that I need. So that's why I was able to mix two textbooks together and that's why the slides are from two different textbooks. And the parts which I felt that they are not important, if you can see, I have hidden them in the slide. So once they are hidden, it means that you don't need to focus on them. But anyway, this is the formula that we want to use now. So this is just the formula that we discussed. I've proven, I've proven for you this formula that the risk of the portfolio is equal to the amount that you invest in the risky market plus the risk of the in a stock market. And this is just the formula that we discussed just now in the video about it. So now what the question is saying you, the question is saying that the risk of a stock market, risk asset is increasing and the risk, sorry, the return, the return on the stock market is increasing and the risk on the stock market, sigma M is the same. Now it, it explains, it wants you to say that first, what will happen to the slope of the function, which is this. And then it asks you that to discuss that whether you prefer to have more stock in your portfolio or less stock. So I just give you a few minutes. The answer for the first part of the question three is very simple. So what is the answer for the first part? What is the formula actually? So the formula, you have to remember this formula is important, right? So what's the formula? The formula is that the, re the return on the portfolio is equal to the return on the risk-free assets plus the slope and then we have the risk on the portfolio, right? So this risk and return, this formula is showing the relationship between risk and return. But of course, we are looking to have to know that what is the return. The return is the return on the risk free plus the slope of the function. Now you have to just memorize this slope of the function. The slope of the function is that return on the risky assets, which is a stock market, minus the return on risk free assets divided by the risk of the stock market. So if you write, this is the formula of budget line. So this is investor, investor's budget line. So now it's very simple. That question part A is asking you what? It is asking you that the expected return on the stock market increases. So the expected return on the stock market means RM. So RM is increasing. Right, so that's why it's very simple. So what is changing in this? And it is mentioning that sigma M means that the risk on the stock market is the same. So it's just very common sense that if the risk of the, sorry, if the return on something is increasing and the risk is, risk is remaining the same, so what do we expect? So of course we expect that we increase the portion of investment in the stock market. Am I right or not? Of course, once the risk is the same, so we expect that we, once we want to have higher invest, higher return, so we normally we expect that we have to have higher risk. So once we know that the risk is remaining the same and we're gonna gain the higher return, 
So that's why, of course, it is a very good investment opportunity. So that's why we increase the portion of the uh, portion of the stock in our portfolio. Okay, that is the uh, what question wants us. And then the last thing that the question is asking us is saying that what will happen to the slope of the budget line? So what will happen to the slope of the budget line if we assume that here is, for example, our initial budget line? For example, I put BL line one. So which part of the budget line is going to change? So RM is increasing. So it means that with increase in RM, a slope increases. Am I right? So it means that we expect that the budget line is becoming steeper. So how about the intercept? The intercept is among all the RF is remaining the same. So that's why it means that the budget line will be like this. This is BL2. How we can show that with the um, with fixed amount of risk, the return has increased. How we can show that? It's simple that we assume that the risk is here, is fixed, whatever amount. And then now we show that previously the amount of the portfolio, return on the portfolio has been this much. Now the return on the portfolio is increasing. And this is also showing the increase. So this is very easy question, right? So if I ask you that, what will be the complicated question based on this, can you tell me? That what question can be, in which scenario this kind of questions can be complement, complicated a bit. You see that if, for example, I ask you that this component, RM will change or sigma F will change. It's very easy, why? Because we have RM and we have sigma M only in the slope of the function. So that's why we know that only the change will be in the slope of the function. But what if, if I ask you that RF will change? So because we have RF both in the intercept and in the slope. So that's why you can understand from the question itself, you can understand that what kind of questions you can expect to receive. So you can expect to receive that any of this component is changing, right? So, but if RM is changing, is sigma M changing? It's not something difficult because only the slope of the function is changing, fine. But once, for example, the RF that we have both, then the question, it means that you have to focus, you have to explain on two things. So, and I think that's what the next part is asking you. The next part is asking you that the return on risk-free assets is increased. This is part B. Is that, am I right, my friend? Because I have so many different types of the tutorial questions. So we, are we talking about the same quick tutorial questions? So do you have this? That it is saying that the return, return on risk-free asset. increases. Okay. Now, at least show me one reaction. Yes, are we talking about the same thing? Uh, yours is decreased. Okay, so no matter that whether it is increase or decrease, the justification is the same. Okay, I just explain about increase. But anyway, the justification will be to, for decrease will be totally opposite of what I explain now. Okay, so I explain for the increase. Maybe um, you can practice yourself that what will happen if the scenario is decrease. So now we know that RF is changing, RF for example is increasing. So that's why we have the change in, the change in intercept, and we have change in a slope.
So it means that if I want to draw this budget line, so how will be the budget line first of all? It means that the budget line will shift up and then of course will be flatter. So it means that budget line shifts up and will be flatter. Okay. Now we want to know that what will happen to the portion of the stock in our portfolio. So if we draw it. Okay, now we want to know that what will happen. This is the slope and intercept. So one part of the question is answered. Then we have to answer the second part of the question. The second part of the question is asking that to say that whether the portion of the stock in your portfolio will increase or decrease. So the first thing which comes to your mind, what is the answer? That RF is increasing. So the first thing which comes to your mind, You say that, okay, this is a risk-free asset. So once it is risk-free asset, the return on this is increasing. So such a good thing because it doesn't have any risk. So that's why we increase, we increase the portion, the portion of, for example, T-bills, which are the risk-free side T-bills in our portfolio portfolio and um, once we want to increase the amount of the TBS in our portfolio so it means that the portion of the stock will decrease right therefore portion of a stock decreases so why the portion of the stock decreases? Because we know that our budget, the amount that we can specify on these two assets is the same. So it means that once we have the same budget and we notice that the risk-free asset now has, is giving us higher return. So that's why we assume that the amount of the return on the risk-free asset is getting closer to the amount of the return on risky assets. So that's why we are very happy because we don't need to bear a lot of risk. And with minimum risk, we can earn higher return. So that's why we decrease the amount of the stock in our portfolio and we invest in the TBS. So that's why it means that we are even ready to, to sell some of our stock to release, to get more money. And then, then we bring this money to the risk-free assets. And then we, we buy, for example, treasury bills. So in this scenario, we know that the portion of the stock in the portfolio is decreasing. So that's the first thing. Now, the other scenario. This is question page one. So we go here, I say continue. Question three. So other scenario is a scenario that for the people, that those people, those groups of people, they have a particular preference in their mind. So how is the preference of these people? These people are saying that once I want to divide my money to buy, uh, to make up my portfolio and to buy some risky and risk-free assets, so I have something in my mind, exactly the way that segmented market theory explained about investors. So they said segmented market theory is saying that the investors and they have 
preference in their mind and they follow their preference. So that's why some of the people, they have some particular preference that they are just following that they don't care about the rest. So this group of people are a group of people that they say that, hey, I have one preference in my mind that that preference is telling me that I expect to get, for example, a percent of return on T-bills. This a percent is what is in my mind. And once, as soon as I get this in a percent, then I, I like to invest the rest of the money. So it means that invest the remaining in risky assets. So this group of people, so you can see that again, I am implementing the theories in this topic. So the previous scenario, I was saying that the investor, we have different kinds of investors, right? And people, different people, different consumers are behaving differently. That's why we say that this is a topic of consumer behavior. So in the first, in the previous scenario, we were discussing about one kind of investor that that investor doesn't have any particular preference in mind and just is saying that, I want to minimize my risk. Now the risk uh, free assets are giving more return. So that's why easily I sell some of my stocks and then I invest on TBL. That's, that's it. Expectation theory. Easily they replace. Now here, this person is saying that I have particular preference in my mind. So I want to just get 8% from TBL. So I don't care that how much to invest, whether to increase my investment or decrease my investment in T-bills, that doesn't matter for me. What matters for me is that I want to increase, I want to reach to this 8%. So not this person, not let's discuss from the point of view of this person. RF has increased. So it means that with same amount of the stock that this person has. Now, because RF has increased, this person is going to have more percentage of the return on T-bills. So RF has increased if this person, if keeps the same amount of T-bills, the return will be higher than a percent. So is it something that this person wants? No, this person has a particular preference in the mind. So that's why this person doesn't like this, doesn't like that the return will go higher than a percent. So what does this person do? This person is saying that I have to decrease the amount of the TBs because now the return has increased. So that's why this person is saying that you can, for example, I can write here that the return on TBs on TBs is actually amount of TBs, okay, multiplied by RF, okay. So now we want to make sure that this return is remaining fixed. So if the return wants to be fixed and we know that RF has increased, so it's for sure that we have to decrease this amount to make sure that we have a fixed return on asset. So that's why from point of view of this person to keep to keep a percent fixed, the amount of T bills has to decrease. So it means that the amount to decrease means what? Means that this person will sell T bills. 
So once this person is selling T-bills, means what? Means that this person is transferring the money, transferring to stock market. And now this person is saying that, hey, my 8% is achieved. So that's why now I have more money to go for stocks. So that's why I invest more on stock. So now what is the answer for this question? The answer, the final answer was that the amount of the stock in the portfolio can go increase or can decrease. So it depends on consumer behavior. So that's why again, consumer behavior is appearing here that whether this consumer wants to follow the expectation theory or the segmented market theory. If it is the expectation theory, they can easily replace. So that's why the amount of the stock in the portfolio, you remember we show it with B, so it's decreasing. Or the person might follow segmented market theory. So if the person is following segmented market theory, the amount of the stock in the portfolio is going to increase. So that's why it all depends on the preference on the people of the people. So again, another example that you can see that in different situations, people might differ, might react differently. So now what normally I give in my exam, so the first part I discussed, for example, that whether the amount of the uh, stock in the portfolio can go either way, can go increase or can go decrease. But normally, for example, if I want to give as a final, as a final exam, I don't discuss about expectation and segmented market theory. I say that, okay, now I'm giving you this option, you discuss that, for example, each investor each part is following which theory and based on the theory you have to discuss about that, right? So that's why it is very important that you understand the concept behind all of our topics. Okay, anything else? Any questions so far? So if no question, we can continue with our question four. Yes, Etan. No, I want to say no questions. Thank you so much. If you were not in my class, what could we do with the whole silence in the class? My friends, say something, at least I take a bit of rest. Hi, miss. Hello, how are you, Rikesh? I'm yeah, listening carefully. Sorry? Listening carefully. Listening, listening carefully and quietly. Okay. So is there hmm. the one, I don't know, it was you or it was Deepan that were asking me to discuss about midterm questions in the class. It was Deepan or you? Yeah, it was me. Yeah. It was you. Okay, so did you see that, that I have posted all, everything in time? Yeah. Okay. So is that, is that sufficient? Is that what you want? Well, I'm not sure still about certain questions. Sorry? Like, I'm not sure about certain questions. Why the answer is wrong? Why, you know, that particular answer is correct? Oh, so it means that even I have given you the answer, still you're not, you're not uh, justified. Because certain questions, uh, you, you know, you say that you can uh, have more than one answer. Mm -hmm. So I saw that the answer is uh, just like, there's only one answer, but I thought there would be two answers that are correct. Mm, yeah, I know, but this is the, the specification of MCQ, right? So sometimes, for example, you say A, B, C, and then say A and B, but necessarily A and B is not correct. Yeah. So I myself, I know that the, the midterm was a bit confusing. That one I know, but I'm not saying that I didn't do deliberately. I did it deliberately because I didn't want you to start texting in the exam. I wanted you to be focused. Because I felt like a few answers could apply, like based on the text, you know, more than one answer could apply. So um, if you want, you yeah, can I guess I'll ask, consultation. Yeah, ask you personally. Yeah, if you want, um, you can set a consultation or discuss with you but I'm sure about the answer.
So anybody, anyone you want to discuss about your, you want to see your results? I can share the results. I have Excel file. I can show the Excel file with you. And um, yeah, I can discuss about the questions with you. Okay, so shall we go for our question four? Yes, miss. Okay. Mm. Four. Okay, again, question four is something that you all can do it. All of you, you can calculate question four, it's very easy. So let's read the question and then I give you again a few minutes. It's saying that suppose that Soros utility function is given like this, where I represent the annual income in whatever unit. So then it's saying that if we assume that Sarah is currently earning an income of 40,000, or you can, for simplicity, maybe you can use, because it is saying that income is thousands of dollars, so maybe you can use I is 40. And can earn that income next year with certainty. So it means that the certain income is 40, and then of course you put 40 here, you can get the certain utility. She's offered a chance to take a new job that offers a 60% a probability of earning 44,000 and 40% probability of earning 33,000. Should she take the new job? Then it's asking you that, let's we assume that for some unexplained reason. So once you see this, that is saying that unexplained reason, so it means that the answer for should she take a job is no. If it was yes, then it, the next part wouldn't be that for some unexplained reason. So that's why you, you know that the answer for this part should you take a job is no. So it means that definitely, for example, you can see that you have to compare, confirm utility with um, expected utility. So you do the calculation, you compare. Then it's saying that, okay, for some unexplained reason, Sarah decides to take this job. She would be willing to buy the insurance. You know that what is the insurance? Always insurance is to put to protect us against the risky situation. So that's why this person is ready to buy the insurance. Okay, now, even if you don't read the whole question. So what does it mean? It means that once you are ready to buy the insurance, it means that you are ready to pay for the premium. So once you are ready to pay the premium, so now you have to calculate that how much is the premium that you are willing to pay. So again, I give you a few minutes. And then mm, shortly you can discuss this yourself in the class. Okay, for the first part of the question, which is asking you that, should the person take the new job? It means that you have to calculate the expected utility and then you confirm the expected utility with confirm utility, right? So you have to calculate two utilities, expected utility and confirm utility. So anybody, any numbers? So utility function is 10i and then the confirm i is 40. So that shows that the utility of 40 is equal to 10 multiplied by 40 and is equal to 20. Then the expected utility. The expected utility, what is the formula of expected utility? The probability of one situation multiplied by the utility of that situation plus probability of the other situation multiplied by 
the value of other situation. So now what is the probability? Probabilities are given in the question, just we have to calculate the utility associated with, which, uh, with each situation. So the utility, it means that here is 10 multiplied by 44, and then here is 10 multiplied by 33. So how much is the final number? Final number, it should be 19.85. So this is the expected utility. So which one is more? So the expected utility, the expected utility is less than confirmed one. So that's why should not take a job, should not take the job. Another reason that you can mention if you haven't calculated from this way, you have another option to calculate it from um, second way. For example, you can say that option B to answer the same question. Is that what is it? You can determine that Sarah should reject the object if you want to calculate the expected value of the new job or the expected income. So how much is the expected income? Expected income. So it's equal to, again, probability of one situation multiply the value plus probability of other situation multiplied by the value. So probability of one is 44, sorry, the value of one is 44, the value of other one is 33. So how much is the expected income? The expected income, I think it should be calculate. You should be like this. This is 39 and 39,600. So it's the expected income. So again, the expected income is less than less than the confirmed income. So that's why again. It is another way to just say that the person should not take the job. So this is part, first part. Uh, yeah. Then the second part. Second part is saying that, thank you for help. It's saying that, let's assume that, okay, it's taking the job and is it saying that how much should he pay? Yeah, the insurance premium. So to calculate the premium, what should we do? The risk premium? Any opinion, any idea? What was the risk premium? He said that the amount between, uh, the amount between the expected income and the confirmed income, which makes the, con um, the expected utility as a confirmed utility. So now this person wants to take job, right? So it means that he has taken the job. So if he has taken the job, how much is the expected utility? Expected utility is 19.85, we calculated before. So now this person wants, he wants to do, he, she wants to make sure that this expected utility, now expected utility means what means that it's not confirmed, right? So it means that he wants to make sure that expected utility becomes confirmed utility. Confirmed utility. So if the expected utility wants to become confirmed utility, what does it mean? It means that you have to just put this expected utility in your utility function and you calculate the level of income, right? So what you have to do is that you have to use the utility function. Utility function is given to you and you want to make sure that this expected utility is the confirmed utility now. 
So what you have to do is that you put 19.85 is equal to 10i. This is the utility function, right? So the utility function, the amount of the expected utility we calculate, not just we want to show that this expected utility is constant. So do you remember that once we were discussing during the class, for example, we had a utility function like this. I said that the expected income is somewhere here. That expected income, you want to have the utility. For example, you have to come and then you see the utility from here. Now what he wants here, he wants to say that now we know that the utility, but this is the expected utility, is this much, okay? So now we want to know that how much is the confirmed utility. It means that we put this utility in the function so to make sure that how much is the income, so this amount, okay? So once we calculate this amount, this difference is giving us the risk premium. So we put this and then we calculate I. So how much is the I? We have to square this. So it means that it's gonna be 10I is equal to 9.85 and the square and then I is equal to Do you have something like 39.4.402? Do you get something like this? Oh, okay, yes. So you got the same now. Fine. So then after we calculated this, now the only remaining part is the definition of risk premium. So what was the definition of the risk premium? So we have to know that how much is the, you remember that risk premium in this graph again, I have shown you that the risk premium is the expected income minus the income which makes this expected utility as a confirmed utility. So now expected income also we calculated. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Fahad. So Fahad has calculated. I'm sure that you all, you could calculate that. We have to know how much is the expected income, then expected income minus this level of income, which makes the expected utility as a confirmed utility. So that's why 39,600 minus 39,402 is 198 is a risk premium. Yeah. So good job. And we can continue with question five and then after that we can end the session so do you like to continue or you are tired maybe for the next week miss mm, next week we continue to finish this or uh, we don't have the lecture and of course the lecture I don't have anything new so I would have discussed the same topic the week after we move on to another topic I miss mean, when it comes to the assignment like um, what's the criteria for a good a good assignment like for scoring I don't have anything to answer about it because I have to read your write-up, then I can compare. Uh, but I explained in the beginning of the class, I don't know whether you were there or not. Um, you have to make sure that all the components given in the article you are writing about and you are linking the factors. Um, 
it is very important to show the relationship between factors. We are talking about technology, environment, and economic growth. So that's why you have to show that technology is affecting environment either positively or negatively, and then environment is affecting economic growth. Either it can be positive or negative. So in another words, we are talking about a kind of mediation relationship, that the environment is mediating the relationship. About these particular variables, maybe in the articles, you can find that the relationship is other way around. Um, you see what I expect at this level, like I assume that you are already last level. So what I expect is that you have to be able to distinguish between the cause and effect that which variable is the cost and which variable is the effect and whether this relationship is a um, bi relationship, it means that it's mutual relationship or is a mono relationship from one factor to another factor. So in that way, I leave it open. I don't say anything particular because maybe according to literature, you may find something which supports your argument. So if you are able to show this kind of relationship and this factor, that's fine. So this is what I, I want normally I look for. For example, one of your friends was showing me a piece and the piece was very good. Actually, the write-up was very good, but the linkage was not there. That, for example, the discussion about the economic growth and the technology was very nicely written, but the environment suddenly was left out. Or somehow, for example, the arguments that you bring to support the environment is irrelevant to the context. So that's why once you, and then the other thing that normally most of the students that I mark, what they lose mark is that the assignment is not consistent. The assignment normally is specifically like this assignment that I like to be very short, the shorter the better, because I assume that I'm reading a story. So from where you start, I, you have to make sure that you end up at the same thing that you started. So somehow, for example, you saw that the technology, for example, is ruining the environment, is creating pollution, and pollution is very bad for the economic growth. But at the end, what you end, for example, there is something else. This is it's about the technology, which is improving the economic growth. So that's why it's not consistent. And that is very common. Uh, sometimes you lose the consistency in between in a way that you, you don't notice it. So these are the criteria, and of course, um, your right of that whole innovativity. For example, if you want to discuss about the environmental impact, so that is very broad topic. So it depends that um, you have to take one angle of it. So it's very important that which angle you want to take because of course the effect of environment and economic growth, I don't know, millions of research on that. It's very repetitive topic. So that's why it is very important that how, which aspect of it you get it at, which is very niche or is very interesting. And then as I mentioned, I always mark comparing the students with each other. For example, I read and then whoever is better, I just put a tick that, okay, I like this, I like this, I like this. Then I mark those that I put tick. Then I refer, I go to the next stage that, okay, the, the, people who are in the second rank. So that's why, for example, this is my B category. Then after that, again, once I mark them, then I go for the people that, to me, for example, is the C category. And that's why that normally I don't release the assignment results very early. The students who have been with me, they know. And even the worst case is that sometimes I submit for the second marking, the second mark is that your marks are very high. That is a comment that, your friends, they know that normally I, re I receive this comment from my second market that always they say that you mark very high. This is not up to a standard. You have to decrease. Uh, yeah, that's off. I think we don't, we don't get time for the next question. Uh, yeah, shall I end the session? I recorded the session. I placed it on times. You want to practice the questions, but I'm sure that you learn today very well. So any question, anything you want to mention? Um, after all of you, you leave the class, I will remain. I normally I leave the last person if anyone wants to ask any question, I'm here. Okay, you can all leave.